Welcome back. This is The Logic Dilemma. I'm American Mike, your host. Coming to you from the Purple Mountain Majesties, from sea to shining sea. America the Beautiful. I say we take him up on it. Let's send him back to Congress. I would love to see that. Why on earth did he say that? Uh, We've talked about it before on this program. I'm glad you're here. We have a lot to discuss today. We're going to be talking more about classified documents, more about January 6th. That's back in the news. I always love talking about January 6th. Hate what happened, of course, but I love talking about it. So stick with me. We're going to have some fun. Now, first and foremost, I want to say we we talked about this on the previous program. After the State of the Union address, Katie Britt gave the rebuttal. And I, I think she did a great job. A little dramatic, sure. But I don't mind that. I'm a little dramatic too. So I don't, I don't mind it at all. Now, she told a story about a girl that has suffered under the hands of illegal activity at and south of the border. Now, everybody jumped all over her and said, that story's not true. That's not true. Well, I was just reading the news today that CNN actually retracted their story about it not being true because they found out, guess what? It is true. So congratulations on that, Katie Britt. Every time you can beat the mainstream media or the liberal media, the more you show that you are the logical one and that to them, logic is a dilemma, a problem. We don't want that here. We want to we talk about in this show how logic is what holds together truth. Yes, we can make decisions based on emotion. Absolutely. But logic is what holds together the truth. If we lose logic in our decisions and our choices, then we lose the truth. Now, it's funny, I've been watching the news and the Democrats are always coming up with something new to attack Trump with. Again, they don't understand why Trump's so popular. And he is, he can fill stadiums of people. And they don't get it. Why? When they have to pay people to sit in the audience to listen to Biden, and they do, They pay him to be there sometimes. Not all the time. But they can't fill stadiums of people like Trump can. And the media just sits there and thinks, why? So they try to figure out ways to attack him. A couple of weeks ago, they were saying, oh, he was a, he's going to be a dictator. He's going to be a dictator. Oh, he's a, he's going to, this is how he's going to be a dictator. He's not going to be a dictator. In fact, he's going to be the opposite of a dictator. This following is from his inauguration. Tell me if this sounds like a dictator to you. Because today we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another or from one party to another. But we are transferring power from Washington, D.C. and giving it back to you, the people. Okay, so giving the power back to the people. Does that sound like a dictator? That actually sounds like the opposite of what a dictator does. A dictator wants the government to control everything, and not the people. Now, 
Did he follow through on that promise almost eight years ago? He did. During his presidency, he he did a lot to make sure that the people received the power and that the people were able to choose for themselves of what they were wanting to what they wanted to do and how they wanted to move forward. He didn't act as a dictator. So why is he going to now? Well, ask a Democrat, because I can't tell you. Trump has time and time again explained how he was going to give the power back to the people. Now, the dictator narrative didn't really take hold. So the Democrats are started pushing recently since the since the State of the Union address. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of articles about Republicans that are turning on Trump. And what's interesting about this is I saw one. It said, oh, "I one it said a unnamed Trump advisor said, I." I no longer support him. And in the, and it goes on in the article to say another unnamed advisor. And then it says another unnamed person, all of these unnamed Republicans turning on Trump. In the world of journalism, do you know what the words unnamed means? Well, it means... We don't really have a source, but we have an opinion and we need further testimony to make you believe it. It's the equivalent of saying, well, they say, you've heard people do this. They say, you're always thinking, who's they? That's the equivalent of an unnamed source tells us that they're no longer supporting Trump. An unnamed source. They might as well say, well, they say you should be eating a spoonful of cod liver oil every day. Who's they? No one knows. But they have an opinion and they need you to believe their opinion. They need you to believe it. They feel that it's incredibly important that you believe their opinion. So they come up with these unnamed sources as witnesses, as somehow somehow that accounts for them being able to, to tell the truth. That we, that we know that, oh, well, <laughs> I mean, if an unnamed source said it, well, then I have no choice but to believe it. As if we're that dumb. They say, who's they? Well, classified documents are back in the news today. I, I just find this to be one of the most hilarious things. Because on one hand, they're wanting to prosecute Trump for having his classified documents. And you know what? And this is what Democrats, and you've heard this, you've heard this. Democrats have been saying, oh, Trump, he worked to try to hide his classified documents. And he tried to, he tried to hide it. And he, he didn't want to give them back. But on the other hand, Biden, he gave up his immediately. He gave his up immediately. As soon as he figured out that he had classified documents, he immediately reported it. This is what we've been hearing from Democrats for many, many months. As they've said... It's not the same. Trump is bad news. Whereas Biden, he immediately gave it up. Well, the testimony came out 
The testimony of Robert Herr, who investigated Biden's documents. This is from the Department of Justice. So the testimony is released saying that Biden had all of these documents and that he knew about these documents. And he even talked about these documents at times. Well, what's interesting about that is that Biden denies it. Well, I would too. I mean, maybe. I don't want to be caught. If I didn't want to be caught, I guess I I would deny it too, maybe. So I can't fault him for that. But listen to this. First, you're going to hear Biden's voice as people are asking him about the testimony of him discussing classified documents with a ghostwriter of his, a ghostwriter being someone's writing for him, whether it be his biography or autobiography. And then you're going to hear the words from the testimony under oath of Robert Herr as he discusses his findings and the investigation findings. So listen to this. I did not share classified information. I did not share it. With your ghostwriter. With my ghostwriter. I did not. Guarantee you did not. We also identified other recorded conversations during which Mr. Biden read classified information aloud to his ghostwriter. <laughs> okay. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Or, like the report says, he's he just doesn't remember. He's just an old man. He doesn't remember any of this stuff. That's what the report says, right? Eh, I tend to agree because we see it. We see it all the time. I mean, listen, this is a, a pre... When it, when it comes to Biden and his mental state, we saw in the State of the Union this fiery powerful, fast-talking president where he's able to, to talk and, and communicate well. Shortly after that, he releases a pre-recorded message with his wife. Now, pre-recorded means that it's been edited, it's been re-recorded, and they go with the best they have. So this is the best they have. Now, this is just because I want to, I think I, I want to talk about his mental state for just a second. Then we'll get back to classified documents, I promise. But I want to talk about his mental state for a bit. So this is the pre-recording that he made with his wife shortly after this fiery, alive State of the Union that he posted. And what, what, we're, what they're going to do is ensure a national, really endanger our national security. They're going to expend, a, you know, are they going to expand personal freedoms? Well, that's what we're going to do. They're going to do everything to not grow our economy. Literally, there's no, they have no platform. They're all about, they're against everything, not for anything, except the things that are the wrong things. What they're running on, I, I'll, I'll tell you what they're running on. They're running backwards. Mm -hmm. It's about the future, not the past. But guess what? We won't let them win the past. What does that even mean? Won't let them win the past? What does that even mean? You should see the video of this. His wife looks at him like she's wondering, what, what are you even saying? What's interesting about that is it's pre-recorded. That it's not live. It's not a, it's not a press release. Pre-recorded means that that's the best they got. That's the best they got. So what happened? Between that, the State of the Union and that, and all of the other garbage that he was talking that, that weekend after, what happened? It definitely doesn't make sense. Now, a lot of speculation is thrown around about different medications or drugs. 
I can't prove that, so obviously, I, that's hearsay. But it's very odd to see a completely different person. I have to say, he seems different between the State of the Union and that. Now back to the documents. So Robert Herr is testifying before Congress... He's under oath. He's testifying about the report that he and the Office of the Attorney General submitted. Now, they ask him a few questions, and this is that interaction. You have audio recording from his ghostwriter where the president acknowledges that the information he has is classified and he's sharing with his ghostwriter. We have an audio recording capturing a statement from Mr. Biden saying to his ghostwriter in February of 2017, quote, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, end quote. And then again, reciting passages from a meeting in the situation. Yes. And those are in President Biden's own words. Correct. Right. So he's again, the ghostwriter has no classified no, he, he has no cl clearance, no classified clearance to anything, correct? That is our understanding that Mr. Zwanitzer was not authorized to receive classified information. Okay, that's interesting. Did you hear the date on that? These are Biden's own words. This isn't, this isn't made up. We have all the classified documents downstairs. His own words. Now, did you hear the date on that? 2017. So when you hear Democrats say, well, it's different. Biden gave up his docs immediately. What do you think they mean by the word immediately? Because testimony is showing us and, and recordings are showing us that he knew about his classified documents Far before he turned them in. Right? So what does immediately mean? What does it mean when Democrats say, why? Well, he took care of it. That's why, that's why we love Biden. Because as soon as he knew about those documents, he took care of it. Well, that's not true. We know it's not true now. So what are they saying? He had classified documents long before, long, way longer than Trump had classified documents. And Biden was sharing it with people without, without classified clearance. Interesting. It wasn't immediate at all. Biden, Biden, if you look at the history and the timeline of this, Biden only turned in those classified, or the Biden administration, keep in mind, I really don't think Biden knows much about anything. But he only turned in his classified documents when Trump got in trouble. You see, Biden knew about all of that classified material for years. But once Trump got in trouble, they realized, uh-oh, if we're going to go after Trump, you're going to need to be clean too. Oh, Biden immediately took care of it. No, he didn't. We know that now. Well, unfortunately for us, Biden is an old man. This is what the report says from Robert Hur, the Attorney General's office. He's an old man with memory issues. So therefore, we see no reason to even prosecute. And I have to say, 
I agree. He is an old man with memory issues. But this brings up the question that I always ask. Why Biden? Have you ever thought this? So we're all about logic on this show. And we talk about how we want to make choices and decisions based on logic. And not emotion. Of course, we balance that. We balance logic and emotion so that we can make the best decision possible in our lives. But I don't find any logic in Biden being the president. You mean to tell me that in a country of 350 million people, Joe Biden is the best the Democrats have to offer? I don't get it. How is he the best they have? How is somebody not standing up and saying, no, it's not working. I'm going to run instead of Biden. I don't know. Logically, Biden makes no sense. Here we're so concerned about his cognitive abilities and his memory. And... Yet yeah, he's the best they have? Have you seen this guy eat an ice cream cone? If I was on Biden's team, let's say I'm I let's say I'm on Biden's team. The one thing I would say is don't ever let him eat ice cream in public. I'm not joking. Go look it up. He stands there. With this blank stare, eating his ice cream cone, he looks like he's waiting for the bus to take him back to the rest home. With this completely blank look on his face. It looks like you, or you just picked up your, it looks like you picked up your elderly father from the rest home, took him out to lunch, and now you're going to take him back but before you take dear old dad back to the rest home, you make sure to get him an ice cream cone. I can just picture it now, sitting there. Dad, dad, here, here's the dad. No, dad, dad, no. Here are the flavors, dad. I, this is what I picture them doing with him. Because you should see this guy eat ice cream. Anyway, I digress because that's... How he eats ice cream doesn't make him a good or bad president. I know that. But that's my point that I'm trying to make is logically, that's the best they've got? How is Biden the best they've got? You have nobody else. That could be president. That's a Democrat. No, you have to go with Father Time himself. And I'm not talking about, I, I know that Trump's not far behind him in age. And I know, I know that Trump makes mistakes too. I know that. But not as many. Not, not like this. Definitely not like this. In Pennsylvania, I have a message for you. Send me to Congress so I can support this right. And I promise you, we take back Congress. We, we will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. Nobody does that. Nobody sits there and talks about going back to Congress. Nobody has ever run for president and asked to be sent to Congress. It doesn't happen. Do they, does his team just sit on pins and needles all the time? 
waiting for him to say something and they go, oh, crap. Ah, why did he say that? Ah. You see, we see this every single day with him. This is not, this is not just every once in a while he makes a mistake or we can tell he's tired and he, and oh, he's been traveling a lot. No, every day, every speech. Wow. Just interesting. I just think it's interesting that that's the best they've got. Well, let's move on. Uh, January 6th is back in the news today. January 6th is a very hard subject because not a lot of people know what happened. Now, I can tell you we're going to talk about facts. I'm not going to bring in any conspiracy theories or anything like that. Maybe. I might. I'll tell you if I do. I'll tell you what's a what's conspiracy theory and I'll tell you what's theory and what's what's not and what's fact. January 6th What's interesting about that is it starts out there's a lot that leads up to January 6th. I know that. Um we have the election the Trump wasn't happy with the results. That's not new. Most candidates aren't happy with the results. Um, unless it's, unless, you know, especially if they're so close. So Trump was not happy with the results. It was improbable for Biden to pull off the win. That's a really hard, that's very hard to come back from for Trump. The On election night, we call it the night the vote count stopped. Remember that night, how weird that was? Counts were coming in and Trump was winning. He was, in fact, everybody knew. He was, it was done. It was a done deal. Uh, China started trading, indicating that Trump had won. Which is a very good indicator, by the way. And all of a sudden, in those, those states, just a handful of states, it, the vote count just stopped. And we waited. We went to bed that night knowing that Trump was so far ahead, there's nothing you can do. The next day, Biden had somehow pulled ahead. Somehow. Now, a lot of people say it was the mail-in votes. Okay. All right. But even in the bluest of blue counties, Trump was still pulling a 7% vote. In the bluest of blue cities, he was still pulling a small percentage. So the probability of Biden, he would have had to have all of the mail-in vote. And the probability of that, well, I'm not saying it's impossible for him to win, because it wasn't. He won. Sure. But the improbability was so low that it, it's a little bit hard to accept the results. That's what leads us into January 6th. Already people were angry about the fact that, guess what? I, <sighs> I don't like the results of that election. So not a lot of people did. Now, did Trump try to intimidate people on phones and calling governors and stuff? Yeah, we have, we have re recording and audio of all of that. Yeah, he talked to him. Of course. But Trump's number one ask was everybody just hold off. Don't certify anything until we investigate what happened. That's all Trump was asking. Now he did. He does it in his Trump way, 
But that's what he's asking. He's not, he's not saying, hey, let, let's lie about it. I lost. Trump was not saying, well, I lost the election. So what I want you to do is I want you to lie about it so that it looks like I won. That's not what he was saying. In all of his conversations he was having with, with governors and all of that, he was just asking for everyone to hold off until we can do an investigation. You know, we need to, I obviously we need to find more votes. He's telling, he was telling them in Georgia, we need to find 11,000 votes. The whole, the reason why he was saying that is because he didn't feel like he didn't he didn't he didn't feel he didn't feel like anybody had to make it up. He was telling everybody that they're lost. These votes are lost. He's not trying to I I if you look at all of the all of the conversations that he had with people he wasn't acting like he wanted everybody to lie for him. He was acting like he needed he wanted them to sincerely find all of this stuff, all of these votes. Where are they? I should have more. And he's right. He should have. He should have had more than Biden. But he didn't. And Biden won. There you go. Who am I to argue, right? The ballots are all shredded immediately anyway, so there's no way of going back and seeing, but there are a lot of conspiracy theories around what happened during that vote count. We won't entertain any of that. But I have my suspicions. You know what's funny about this? Let's say, let's just play a little game here. And you know how I love games. Let's play a little game. Let's pretend that they that somebody there was this big push to cheat during the the election and so Biden won. Let's say if and now this is a purely hypothetical situation. Let's say Biden did win as a result of cheating. Let's say he did win as a result of a whole bunch of ballots being dropped off in the middle of the night. Let's say he did win as a result. This again, hypothetical, hypothetically speaking, of course, let's say he did win by all of the million ballots that were coming in, having only Biden's name marked and nothing else filled out. Let's say that actually did happen. Because there were people who saw something that could be interpreted as that. A lot of ballots. A lot of mail-in ballots with just Biden's name filled in. Hmm, interesting. There are a lot of people on the ballot. And they only had to count Biden's name. Because it was the only one filled out. Anyway, let's say that is true. I figure if that was true, you would have one shot. One shot. That's all you get. You saw what happened in Jan on January 6th, and that was... They didn't... Nobody knew for sure what, what had happened. If the election was rigged, and I'm saying if because I, you know, Biden won. He won. I'm just hypothetically speaking, if. That would mean that whoever set this up got one shot. And you wasted it. On Biden and Harris? <laughs> Oh, 
Oh. Good job, guys. If that's true. If that's true. I'm hypothetically speaking. I just want to say great job. You you picked a good one there. Anyway. Because of the election and because of the discrepancies with the votes and then some of the issues, Trump was unhappy. We go into January 6th, where Donald Trump gives a speech. Now, I'm going to play for you first the speech, the part of the speech that every liberal media and news outlet plays. This is what they play. And... They have played it countless times. This is what was played during that impeachment hearing after the fact, after January 6th. They played this. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Okay. That's what they always play. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. I'm going to go with you. We're going to go down there. We're going to show strength. Now, I know that he ended his speech with fight like hell. I know that. I've heard that. Keep in mind that this is a political speech. So there is a level of drama that comes along with political speeches. It happens all the time. All the time. And everyone knows that. Now, I get that that's that's a that's a hard thing to listen to because what transpired after that was was a hard thing to watch. And it it was a bad thing what happened. And we'll talk about that. But first, I want to show you, uh, they always play that. And the liberals and Democrats always play that. And they played that on Capitol Hill. And they played that for the impeachment hearing. They played that with the January 6th committee that they put together to try to, try to get Trump. They played all of that. I want to play this part of the speech. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Today we will see whether Republicans stand strong. Peacefully and patriotically. How come Democrats never play that? They never would. They never do. Anytime they play anything, it's always... They always leave that peacefully and patriotically peace out. Why? Well, we know why. Well, it doesn't fit the narrative, the story that they're trying to tell, right? The fact is, given the First Amendment of the Constitution, we, the people, have the right to freedom of speech. Now I understand that we can't necessarily say whatever if, if it's going to hurt someone. I get that. We have the freedom of speech, but we also, under the First Amendment, have the right to peaceably assemble. So is it wrong for a leader to call for a peaceful and patriotic march? No, it's not wrong. In fact, Trump was within his... American constitutional right 
to put this together. The fact is, constitutionally, I know he says a lot of crap. I get it. I know he does. But constitutionally, the moment he asked that group, in the moment, in his speech, to march peace, peacefully and patriotically, peacefully, that's a big, big word, because it changes the whole tone of what he's trying to accomplish. And the minute he said that word, peacefully, is the very minute that all violence at the Capitol rested squarely upon the shoulders of those who caused it. You see, Trump didn't want people to bust into the Capitol. He just, he wanted the people to stand with him. He believes an injustice was done. He wants the people to stand with him. Did he, did he want violence? No, he asked for peace. Okay, well, how come the Democrats never say that? Ah, because it doesn't fit their story. All right, so we have the speech, but what's interesting about the speech, I wanted to point this out. Now, keep in mind, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about who was actually at the Capitol. And there are conspiracy theories about the FBI being there. Although, uh, the head of the FBI has testified under oath that they had no one on the ground. We do know that the CIA was there, but they were trying to help. Okay. They were there. They were trying to help. All right. Well, that's what we're told anyway. But given the, t the timeline of this is very interesting. You see, they start, they start gathering in front of the Capitol and they overwhelm police and they push themselves into the Capitol uh, around about 12.53 p.m. on January 6th. About 12.53 p.m. Well, that's an interesting time. Because Trump will have finished his speech by then. But he didn't. He actually didn't finish his speech until 1.10 p.m. Which means there were people already at the Capitol breaking in before he ever even finished his speech. Well, if Trump caused the violence, as Democrats say, then wouldn't it be part of the speech? He gives the speech... He gets them all worked up. They march down to the Capitol, but they didn't. They broke into the Capitol before Trump even finished his speech. But remember, Trump had a big following of people at his speech. So who was breaking into the Capitol? Trump supporters? That doesn't make any sense. Trump supporters were with him. So who's breaking into the Capitol? Well, I don't know. Let's say I, if I supported Trump, and if I was there, I would want to see his speech. And I would wait until his speech was finished and then go to the Capitol. So why were they breaking into the Capitol and his speech wasn't even completed yet. Now, a lot of people say, well, there were people leaving before his speech was finished. You know that that doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. 
You're there in Washington, D.C. to see this man speak. You're going to leave? And you're going to say, oh, you know what? That's it. I'm going to go bust him up at the Capitol. Maybe. But that's not logical. The logical thing would be that, well, let's finish. Let's wait until Trump's done, and then we'll go down to the Capitol. That means the Capitol would have been broken into about an hour later than it did. Or so. I thought that timeline was a little odd until I heard one thing that I didn't realize before. Trump's speech was late. Does that mean anything? I don't know. Maybe. Trump started his speech about 45 minutes late. If Trump started his speech on time, the breaking at the Capitol would have timed it perfectly with the ending of his speech and the walking to the Capitol, it would have timed up perfectly. But because Trump started his speech about an hour late, well, it was about 45 minutes late, they were already breaking into the Capitol before he had finished his speech. So the question I've always had, who was breaking into the Capitol. They said they were Trump supporters, but a Trump supporter would have been with Trump. Anyway, just an interesting bit of information there. Timeline doesn't match up. Now, after Trump finished his speech, we, well, he wanted to... Go back to the Capitol. This is according to a, girl, a woman by the name of Cassidy Hutchinson. Cassidy gave testimony in front of a hearing, in front of members of the Congress, under oath, she gives a testimony of something she overheard. Not overheard. They told her the story. <laughs> what? Whose idea was this? To bring her in. Now, you got to hear this. This is her testimony that she originally gave under oath. Might I add? It's a little long. All so stick with me. Here we go. We understand, Ms. Hutchinson, that the plans for the president to come to the Capitol um, had included discussions. You're listening to Liz Cheney about, here. Uh, what the president would do when he came up to the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, let's look at a clip of one of your interviews discussing that issue with the committee. When you were talking about a scheduled movement, did um, anyone say what the president wanted to do when he got here? No. Not that I can specifically remember. I remember. This is Cassidy. Different ideas discussed with between the Mark and Scott Perry, Mark and Rudy Giuliani. I don't know which conversations were. Eligible. This is their star witness. I don't know what he personally wanted to do when he went up to the Capitol that day. She doesn't know anything. I know that there were discussions about him having another speech outside of the Capitol before going in. I know that there is a conversation about him going into the House chamber at one point. All stuff she's overheard. As we've all just heard in the days leading up to January 6th, on the day of the speech, both before and during and after the rally speech, President Trump was pushing his staff to arrange for him to come up here to the Capitol during the electoral vote count. Let's turn now to what happened in the president's vehicle when the Secret Service told him he would not be going to the Capitol after his speech. First, here is the president's motorcade leaving the ellipse after his speech on January 6th. Okay, so the motorcade is leaving. And you can see the car driving off. You can see his supporters taking selfies, smiling, laughing. Doesn't look like the angry mob. 
But Liz Cheney is the one that's driving this. Ms. Hutchinson, when you returned to the White House in the motorcade after the president's speech, where did you go? When I returned to the White House, I walked upstairs towards the chief of staff's office, and I noticed Mr. Renato lingering outside of the office. Once we had made eye contact, he quickly waved me to go into his office, which was just across the hall from mine. When I went in, he shut the door, and I noticed Bobby Angle, who is the head of Mr. Trump's security detail, sitting in a chair, just looking somewhat discombobulated and a little lost. Um, I, I discombobulated is a funny word. Did you effing hear what happened in the Beast? I said, no, Tony, I, I just got back. What happened? Tony proceeded to tell me that when the president got in the Beast, he was under the impression from Mr. Meadows that the off-the-record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol, and when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it, it's not secure, we're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. <laughs> Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel and Mr. When Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. Meaning Trump tried to strangle him. And was Mr. Engel in the room as Mr. Renato told you this story? He was. What a, an amazing detailed story. What's wrong with this story? Hey, hey, just uh, what, what's the first thing you think of that's wrong with this story? You have a person that's testifying before Congress under oath of a story that she was told secondhand. Whose idea was this? I, I ask, you know, every time I think of people who are trying to get Trump. And it's not just Democrats. We've got Liz Cheney up there. Every time I think of people who are just, they're trying to just get Trump. I don't care what we have to do. We just have to get him. I find myself asking the question, whose idea was this? You have a testimony of a of a girl who's who overheard some things. And the entire testimony, especially when they said, what do you, th what did he say he was going to do when he got there? And she says, um, well, I like, don't, don't really know what he was going to do, but, um, uh, I heard like he was going to like do, do stuff. When he got there, that's, she was treated like a star witness for the January 6th panel. That's your star witness. I don't know. I don't know what I heard, but, um, it, it wasn't good. Hmm. Great. Then. She goes on to tell this story about Trump in the back of the car. And he starts, he lunges forward. And he grabs the steering wheel. And they have to grab his arm. And they're like, we're going back to the West Wing. Sounds like a movie. Doesn't it? Anyway, then he lunges for his throat. 
Well, guess what? The story never happened. It didn't. A panel was uh, a committee. I hate these committees. I don't care what side you're on. I hate these committees. But things need to be investigated, I know. But a committee was put together, led by Representative Barry Loudermilk of Georgia, a Republican, and he released the report last Monday as to what they found. And they interviewed all the people that were in the car at the time. Not this Hutchinson, who is a star witness that never witnessed a single thing. No, no. They interviewed the actual driver. The actual head of security. You know, the people that actually matter in this. They said the select committee was designed, uh, and this is actually what the committee found out. Um, when it says the select committee, this is the committee Nancy Pelosi put together to figure out uh, this is the Liz Cheney committee, the January 6th committee. This um, this Barry Loudermilk committee found out that the Liz Cheney January 6th committee was designed to promote a political narrative. And this is a quote from the report that was just put out last Monday. Pelosi made the unprecedented decision to refuse to appoint minority members chosen by the minority to the select committee, meaning that January 6th committee. Again, they go on, and this is a quote. They hired Hollywood producers to assist with their primetime hearings. Interesting. Hollywood producers, huh? They refused to adopt rules allowing them to operate without limits to project their predetermined narrative to the world. So that's the January 6th committee. So they went on to say Liz Cheney and Benny Thompson promoted Cassidy Hutchinson's sensational revised testimony and hid witness testimony from White House and Secret Service employees with firsthand knowledge that directly contradicted Hutchinson's version of events. So the January 6th committee actually hid testimony from people with firsthand accounts that contradicted Hutchinson. Well, that's interesting. They just needed Trump to sound really bad. If they don't, then... They're going to fail. Anyway. So. Hutchinson co conducted three transcribed interviews with the select committee, that January 6th committee, before substantially revising her story in her fourth transcribed interview, despite knowing how significantly her testimony changed. The select committee promoted it as fact. That's the problem. They go on to say in the report that they promoted her as a star witness, even though her, they know her testimony had changed. Well, we all knew that the January 6th committee was garbage. We all knew that. Well, now we know for sure. They, they said that uh, Hutchinson said that the president said, I'm, I'm a effing president. Take me to the White House now. Okay. Um, the people that were in the car said that that never happened. The driver said he never, Trump never grabbed the steering wheel. Nothing ever happened. So did Hutchinson commit perjury? Well, no. Because what she was testifying on was hearsay. You know, hearsay is not permissible in the court of law. 
You can't use hearsay in a court of law. It can't be, well, I heard this and I heard that. You can't do that. It's, it doesn't work. So anyway, Liz Cheney, she knew the testimony was bad. She went forward with it anyway. Well, that's, that's Cheney for you. I, anyway. So now we have what? We have a weird January 6th timeline that just never really sat with me. We have an investigation, multiple investigations into January 6th that find out the testimonies were were bad. We have Democrats only showing the the bad things, hiring Hollywood producers. If you go to YouTube and you watch all of the that professionally produced material, yeah. It seems like January 6th was the worst thing ever. It was, it's like watching a movie. But if you actually go look at the real footage and the real data, you get a different feeling. It's not sensationalized. Yes, there was violence. And I hate that. I hate that there was violence. Yes. They shouldn't have been there. I agree. They shouldn't have done what they did. But the Democrats sensationalized it to make it sound worse. And then to top that all off, they did something that I can't explain. They shut off communication about it. Remember this? No one talks about this anymore, but it's actually one of the most significant things that happened. They shut off communication. The Biden administration, we know now because Elon Musk blew the whistle on Twitter, worked with Twitter, Instagram, and we know that uh, Facebook was paying the FBI. This is all testimony. <clears throat> so we know that all of this happened. And yet, what were they doing? They were making it so that you couldn't post anything on social media about it. Nothing. People who were there just posting video of it, showing that it's not actually the way the Democrats are saying. They weren't just getting the video removed. Twitter was removing, and Instagram were removing their accounts. Removing their accounts. Okay, going back to the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, we have the freedom of speech. Well, that was significantly overstepped when the Biden administration worked with social media to remove all, all information regarding January 6th. Okay. Guess what? If you're trying to hide something, then something's wrong. That's what everybody was seeing. Ah, huh. well, if you're trying to, if you're trying to get people to stop t talking about it, then there's something wrong. Well, they did. And they were deleting videos off social media. And they were deleting accounts that kept posting videos about this on social media. And they were working with Democrats to do so. Wow. That, that was weird. Why? Why couldn't they just let all the, why couldn't they just let people talk about it like normal? Well, because they needed the story so they could bring down Trump. 
so they could impeach him again after he'd even left office. So that they could vote to impeach him and the one Republican that voted to repeat, impeach him after the fact, after January 6th, Mitt Romney. Ugh. Anyway. As a result of January 6th, you'll hear Democrats talk about it being deadly. It's a deadly, deadly event. Multiple people lost their lives in the attack on January 6th. Deadly. At least. Oh, this is from... I'm reading from the New York Times. <laughs> Published in 2022. Talking about all the people that had died. Number one, Ashley Babbitt. We know that. That was terrible. Oh, my gosh. I feel so bad for her family. She was shot. Unarmed in the, in the Capitol. She was shot by Capitol Police. I, uh, so sorry about that. The next one, Kevin D. Greeson died of a heart attack. Collapsing on the sidewalk west of the Capitol. He was outside, died of a heart attack. Okay. Not really, uh, as a result of January 6th, but okay. Roseanne Boyland appeared to have been crushed in a stampede of fellow rioters as they surged against the police. Well, that's a bad one. That sounds terrible. Although, but it didn't happen. He, we found out that uh, Roseanne Boyland died of an accidental overdose. Not being. Not being in a stampede. Benjamin Phillips. Uh, died of a stroke. Okay. You know what's happening here is we have so many people there. That's. You're bound to get some people dying of heart attacks and strokes, I guess. I don't. Seems odd. Mr. Greeson and Mr. Phillips, those are the two that died of the heart attack and the stroke. It was determined that they died of natural causes. These two would have died no matter what. January 6th or not. Now, he goes on to say, in the days and weeks after the riot, five police officers died. This is tragic. I'm not, I'm not making light of any of this, by the way. Please understand. I've, I'm not making light of this. But Brian Sicknick, we know, was attacked by some of the rioters. Had a confrontation. It, it really wasn't that big of a deal. He died the next day. That was, was odd. Then you have Jeffrey Smith. And Howard Liebengood of Capitol Police, who killed themselves. Killed themselves? Huh. That always makes me feel uneasy. Why? And there were two other police officers who later on killed themselves. So a total of four Capitol Police officers committed suicide. I don't know. That's odd, isn't it? What is what's the logical probability? Because again, we're all about logic, right? What is the logical probability? That four Capitol Police officers committed suicide? Hmm. I don't know. 
You know, just across the Potomac in Washington, D.C., is a place called Anacostia. Anacostia is one of the most deadly cities or townships or whatever you want to call it in the country. In fact, a lot of times they send in pretty heavily armored police to just arrest people and get back out. It's actually a pretty terrible place. And it's right there in Washington, D.C. It's just across the river. Um, I find it hard to believe that a couple of people pushing against cops, breaking windows at the Capitol... made these cops, capital police officers, and two metropolitan police officers who work next to and probably part of, especially these metropolitan cops, working next to one of the most violent areas in the country. And a couple of broken windows at the Capitol made him want to commit suicide. It's sad. Please understand, suicide is a terrible thing. If any of you listening to this feel any type of inclination of wanting to take your own life, please seek help. It's not worth it. So not, in no way am I trying to make light of these, these poor people's lives, but four cops? You have a couple of, couple of, you got a group of people pushing against cops. You have them breaking windows at the Capitol. You have four cops kill themselves in an area that's one of i mean they've seen they've seen violence maybe not the capital police as much but they've seen violence so real violence i don't know that's always ne- that that's always been odd to me it's never really set right i don't know what to think about that four four Logically, that doesn't make sense in my mind, but then again, Democrat, none of, nothing Democrats do really logically make sense in my mind. I don't know. And on that terrible note, I'm going to leave you there. Again, I'm American Mike. Thank you so much for joining us. Follow, like, subscribe, and I'm going to leave you with my favorite clip. Pennsylvania, I have a message for you. Send me to Congress so I can support this right. Send him to Congress, everyone. Thank you very much.